Ze hebben online al? Oké. Okay. Hello. Uh, welcome in our studio. Uh, sorry if we were a bit abrupt to leave the previous meeting, uh, but we, as a performance group, we always prepare carefully <laughs> Uh, an action like this before and there's some reason to because an hour ago some computers started updating automatically which was blocking a next step in the pipeline we need. So anyway, welcome. Uh, I'll start uh, with a quick historic overview uh, and I go, I'll go back to 95. The years 95, 96, 97 were very interesting since at that moment you had like an avalanche of all kind of new te technologies which suddenly became available for the public. Uh, I'm talking about uh, video games, 95. I'm talking about uh, digital telephony, uh, which uh, grew suddenly very fast, even in Belgium. Other things like the internet. The internet had only uh, 98,000 uh, um, subscribers at that moment. Uh, so that was also booming. You had like the Wacom, uh, which suddenly went online. You had like uh, the first oh, right. real... Okay, uh, uh, and is there any other computer than the one of Anna who... Yeah. Okay, so I continue. So at least you have a sound. Uh, we, yeah, we see everything here. So logically, uh, okay. So, uh, so that period was an interesting period, uh, ninety-five, ninety-seven, uh, because also in the arts, which that month were still kind of separated, suddenly uh, it became clear that all these will become integrated. Eh? So as, uh, as I was making cartoons at that moment, you were in automatically able to animate them, to put sound on them, to stream them, to all these kind of things. So suddenly it, it became clear that uh, the whole environment was about to change, which is what XR is a bit about now. Uh, in the meanwhile, I hope we have an image and that you can see something. Uh, if you do see something, <laughs> then uh, I'm in front of a drawing. Uh, in 95, Apple came out with the so-called QuickTime virtual reality tool, uh, which was a way to stitch photographs to each other and turn them into a cylindrical 360 degree image. Uh, I, s I adapted the process for making drawings. You can see the perspective is a bit funny, you see the lines, but then the nice thing was you could be inside. Going at the inside, would it be possible to do it with goggles and, and things like that? So that was the next step. So let's move to the next room. Okay. Okay, welcome in our studio. <laughs> I dropped the part about the excuse, <laughs> the excuse part. <laughs> uh, and I, I want to start to give a quick historical overview uh, because of course uh, we'll have separate parts in, in the way we went from a, a particular way of using XR to the actual way. In my background is a drawing uh, it's a drawing uh, I made in 96. Uh, in 95, Apple QuickTime VR came out. Uh, that was a way to stitch photographs you, uh, to each other while making a, a panoramic uh, tour with a, with a photo camera. Uh, and you could 
uh, turn that into a computer cylindrical image, and in that way you could be inside of the of the photograph. So uh, we made drawings and things like that to be inside of the drawing. Uh, that period, 95, 96, 97, was extremely interesting because suddenly a whole bunch of uh, technologies became available or suddenly started becoming very popular. Uh, the internet suddenly started booming. In Belgium, even in 98, I think, it was still uh, 98,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, and a year after, it already had a zero behind, I think. Uh, so it went very fast. Digital telephony, uh, the computers that became faster so that you were, for instance, an artist able to draw in real time, which was not possible in 95. Uh, so all these kind of things made it clear for all artists some, uh, this is going to change. If we can integrate, uh, or let's say the computer could integrate a lot of different media, uh, and so you would see a new kind of fusion uh, that we are seeing now. Uh, so let's move to the next room. Uh, uh, yeah, so we go to our so called red room. Uh, and I'll start talking about the first uh, experiments we did uh, uh, using uh, VR. VR in the days, so 90s, yeah, so let's say end of the 90s, uh, VR did exist, of course. Uh, it was very cumbersome, very expensive. You had big machines, you needed uh, Onyx computers or silicon graphics. Uh, so it was all very expensive, uh, out of reach for regular artists. Uh, and certainly it was not fit to do something we did on the stage. So uh, actually, as many times this turns into an advantage, so we had to come up with uh, an alternative. And together with the University of Hasselt and with Philip Beckhardt, who unfortunately passed away a few months ago, uh, we uh, built a complete, or rather he built a complete ecosystem um, of uh, omnidirectional cameras, so 360 degrees cameras, uh, a system to connect that to goggles, a system to track it, to stream it, to edit it, and, uh, and so on. So uh, let's simply start with uh, with uh, with the camera side. Yeah. So these these are the kind of cameras uh, that we used. The principle is very simple. You have different cameras with fisheye lenses, and then you stitch that into one not cylindrical but uh, spherical image. Uh, our very first camera is over there. Uh, it is. Of course, this was not so easy to, to, to make all these kind of combinations. So one side had a mirror of 180 degrees, and then there were four cameras uh, that were being stitched. Of course, the, 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 the latency, uh, the, the quality, of most of all, the quality of the cameras was very low, uh, and that will have an effect on how to work with these kind of tools. Of course, you need to see the image, uh, and for that you have goggles. Goggles were available on the market, they were, uh, we, we couldn't use them. Uh, uh, so we bought uh, uh, a kind of goggles that were meant to uh, use for television, uh, that thing that quickly went out of the market. Uh, and then we made headsets on our own uh, that you could uh, fix uh, to the head. It was important to have, to, to fix the goggles in a stable way. Uh, other easy ways to do that were simply put a bandage around the head and things like that. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, maybe it's good to show that here. Another way was, uh, so uh, the, the goggles are here, was that use a medical plastics and just make a mold around your head and so that afterwards you could always use it uh, and put it on your head. Uh, it was, frankly, not much more comfortable, although we tried to make uh, uh, things that you could stay in for a while. Uh, we did tests, uh, how long can you survive with these kind of tools. Uh, uh, I think seven hours was the maximum. Uh, um, also, um, these plastics enabled sometimes to combine it with uh, the cameras. Uh, as you can see, well, I, I'll pick it up here. So the idea was inside you have goggles, outside you have that plastic. We fix cameras to it. Cameras are of a different nature in that kind. They're like these. 
So these are much smaller cameras, but you need many more of them. And then you put them like this uh, on your head. And we try to integrate them that way. Uh, these were the way, the kind of clothes we gave people to wear all this kind of stuff. And in terms of computers, uh, we see some of them there. Uh, the first computers were very large and we had electric wheelchairs which we used uh, to, 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 to make them accompany the walking uh, immersant uh, person, immersed, we call an immersant. Uh, and then later on we had backpacks uh, like these. Uh, and the backpacks also have, always have uh, also a screen in front. The screen in front was to um, is a, is a touch screen and that allowed for the assistant, the personal assistant of the immersant to, to do certain actions, to calibrate, to change sometimes from another movie because we indeed had uh, pre-recorded movies which we then mixed with live cameras running around. So that enabled us to play with reality, engineer reality in a bit, in a bit like uh, I could put you in your own image while you were walking through a room, an image that was taken 15 minutes earlier, uh, or I could use the image of someone else walking and transport it to you, someone who's doing about the same. Uh, we did things like this even by satellite sometimes from, uh, from one city in Europe to another. Uh, uh, but the point was that in a live situation you could uh, make these video streams of yourself, of the other, uh, or, or a camera outside, in a way that, how to say, <laughs> puts you into a world that is somewhere in between. Um, and also, I, I, yeah, I forgot to say that sometimes we also put cameras upon the head of uh, the immersions, so that we could use their own image. Uh, uh, if you ask what kind of things, what would be a story like? Well, I mean, a very easy example was the first thing we made was about uh, dementia, about Alzheimer. So the idea was you have someone inside uh, and we start restructuring your own tour that you have been making. So you came through halls, you came through a theater, you came to a particular space. Uh, we had recorded that, uh, you being unaware. We had recorded it from your head, from behind you, and then later on you came in a world where you were walking around, where you suddenly saw yourself coming in, where you were following yourself. Sometimes it was real time, sometimes it was not real time. So this kind of, this kind of actions uh, were very interesting and typically this period, our video-based VR period, uh, was all about the self. The self automatically came into the center. Of course, you had a first person view. Uh, uh, well, not necessarily, uh, we could switch that. But so, uh, it, it, automatically, it was about the self. In the beginning, uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, the trick was to make people believe everything they saw. <laughs> uh, I think everybody with VR will try that at a certain moment. This was working perfectly well. Uh, I remember in, in 2005 and six we had regularly people who actually were completely believing what we were presenting to them. The point was, uh, is this interesting? Uh, we are an experimental company, so then we started turning things upside down and we said, let's, let's, let's do exactly the opposite of what we did before. Let's start doing things very slow, the way that you are very well aware, okay, I, I'm here and this is not what I see or this is not what I am, and let's try to to, to, to start from this, this situation and that brought in something new. Uh, suddenly we got very strong out-of-body effects. Uh, we had them before, you, you, you generate them pretty quickly, but they became very strong, which was a bit proof to the, f the idea that instead of trying to work in the pure virtual, it's better to work in the middle of it. Uh, uh, that is why you get this kind of effects. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, um, I should also mention that in the beginning 
The first experiments we did were with people standing. Uh, there was a reason for that. We had them against these kind of tilting beds. Uh, we used them in a particular way uh, and we have been using them for years because in the build-up, let's say in the dramaturgy of a good immersive performance, uh, it was a way to really take you into a different world because with this simple thing you can in a fundamental way influence the uh, senses because we are not talking about only about the heads and the ears and things like that but also the, uh, the vestibular system, the system that makes you aware what is your position in space proprioception, uh, the, 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 the way that I feel my hand is here uh, because it's linked to my body all these kind of things are also very important uh, and, they, and they make that if you... Uh, where, does this, where do these ideas uh, come from? Uh, well, maybe I should quickly mention uh, before these immersive tools uh, we were making performances with uh, technology and with a, a paralyzed man so who, he could only move his head. Here he is, uh, uh, Paul Antipov. Uh, we had a performance in which we had put him on the stage. Uh, we had made a, a, a pneumatic robot with, with hands uh, and he could steer the robot. So he had fixed uh, at his face uh, tools uh, that enabled him to steer a keyboard uh, uh, and on a monitor he could see uh, through a camera certain things. So of course the first thing we thought about was he needed a helicopter view to know his position because then we'll ask for instance uh, take the glass. Uh, that didn't work uh, at all so he, he, he became sick of it. So uh, uh, the solution was rather uh, strange. It was after a while we put uh, the claw of the, here's the claw of the robot, we put a, a video camera on top of the claw of the robot and of course uh, this does not correspond with uh, a situation uh, that we know, we have no eyes upon our hand but if the brain, if you can talk to the brain and make it clear that this is an extension of the body the brain apparently immediately understands. So right from the start he could nearly write with it. Uh, I'll show some uh, aspects of that later. Um, I think, um, yeah, so let's move into the, uh, the studio. So in 2013 approximately we moved uh, into uh, digital uh, computer graphics, uh, 3D, uh, which again needed a different strategy than the video-based VR we were practicing. Uh, Ishtar will later explain in what direction that is going, but for, for instance the idea of the self, which is so predominant in, the, in this kind of, the other kind of uh, work, uh, changes. So we, we no longer have this kind of effects. Uh, so, uh, or phenomena, effects sound so cheap. Eh? So, uh, uh, so we are now working on a different basis uh, and uh, since we also are in, in uh, research, technological research proje uh, projects, uh, we have been busy a while with VR, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, VP, uh, virtual production, uh, which is also a way of dealing with uh, 3D material. Um, we have a mocap studio with uh, an optical uh, tracking system, and we have the other system with uh, the suits uh, that we can also use wireless. Um, I maybe should go now and show some uh, movie stuff. Uh. Yeah, so, uh, before we start, uh, some of these uh, footage has been used for other purposes, so please <laughs> skip the text you read. <laughs> uh, uh, these are some uh, overviews of all the work. Uh, and first I want to go and take you to uh, working with uh, POF. Um, it, 
Yeah, so here he is. So uh, you see him from upside down. Uh, he was also doing things with these little robots. He could also draw digitally up on the stage. Uh, and here you see him using his robotic arm. Uh, you see the monitor which he's looking at. You see the, the tools that are fixed at his mouth, at his uh, forehead, uh, and things like that. He also needed assistance to breathe. Uh, so that gives an idea of that. So let's move then to, uh, uh, to the video-based VR work. Uh, when we are we're using these tables, we try to cut away every uh, perception. So it was in the dark, you couldn't hear anything, and then we would move these tables and then finally put on the gear. Uh, and also, you notice you have noticed maybe that there was a, a camera on top of the of the goggles, which we also used for a particular purpose. Uh, this is a head swap session. Here are some images where you see that we were registering or recording the immersion as he came in. You can see that they are following a kind of a wheelchair. We used very big computers still at that moment, uh, and uh, and at moments also cables. Uh, um, actually. Yeah, here we just had an image of, there was a moment in a theater where someone asked us, what are you trying to do? I'm working here, I know this place. You took me upside to the second floor, you took me outside, so what is the meaning of it? Uh, so we had him convince him to just stay a while and look at the next person. You have been walking in a circle of 10 meters and you didn't go out at all. So the, the brain adapts all the time uh, with the information it gets. Uh, but of course, as we, in the meanwhile, because this was 2005, as in the meanwhile, we all got used to technology in a, in, a, in, a, in a physical way even. So every smartphone you have has at least 11 sensors inside that measure all kinds of things. So, uh, so these kind of things no longer happen. Uh, another uh, barrier to take was how can you take such experience uh, to multiple uh, people, because we are in theater. Uh, I'll continue later upon that. Here are some more images of the walks we made. So you see the camera following the person here. And of course, there's always an actor who is talking to or accompanying uh, the person. The liveness of the thing is extremely important. Uh, I'll go a bit further. Uh, yeah, this was the part where we uh, made a satellite swap in between Barcelona and Mons in Belgium. Uh, I go a bit further. And here uh, I was talking about what, how do you, what do you do with uh, many people. Uh, Terra Nova was a, a production in 2011. Uh, the strategy we were using there was uh, let's use the outside as well as the inside. So people, this was for 55 people. So in groups they go in and they go out. The story continues uh, and so you look from a different view. So sometimes you look from the inside and sometimes from the outside. But the effect of course is entirely different. The outside you get a story, at the inside you get an experience. Uh, and uh, to to uh, and to choreograph that in a way, of course, was also revealing uh, in terms of uh, if people inside of their virtual world see things that make them do certain things. We didn't ask them. Uh, for instance, if if you are uh, at the street and you see in the immersion someone at the other side. Uh, giving a sign uh, or saying hello, automatically you will go to that person and you will even stretch your hands, something you will never do uh, when looking uh, at a movie, of course. But so, uh, so then you have 11 people doing that at the same time, which is really touching to see. Uh, uh, we have we've been using the, 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 the VR of the previous period uh, for documentaries, for horror movies, uh, uh, for musical sessions, all these kind of things. This was right after the tsunami in Japan. Uh, 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 let's move a bit further. 
Yeah, I switched this, although this is also XR, so we used a lot of things in, in installations because they were interesting. Uh, uh, this was all about, uh, wait, I, let's go to this one. Uh, yeah, this is a cave we made uh, to prove that you see space because you move, not because you have two eyes. So you move in a space, you close one eye and you have perfect 3D and you move in a 3D world. Uh, um, uh, go further. Uh, this was working with virtual production tools. Uh, we use that in theater uh, on stage. Uh, so we, we use the virtual uh, to look at and everything you see here is fake. So the transparency is fake, the light is fake, the shadows are fake. Uh, uh, and to do that, of course, we needed a particular procedure that I cannot explain now. Uh, we also had the, the actors textured, uh, as you can see. Uh, um, okay, uh, uh, and here are some more images of, of how, this is the digital period, how to keep the idea of walking around, how to keep the idea of multiple people looking at and having people inside and still go through a story together. Uh, this was uh, Hamlet's lunacy. Uh, okay, so, so you have motion capture, people following, uh, people inside, uh, and at the end, everybody will go. I will have an immersion. Uh, okay, uh, last step uh, to the digital uh, is, uh, is again large area. I uh, we have been developing together with other people uh, tracking systems for very precise location uh, to enable us to make productions in large spaces. What you see here is interesting uh, to know how you sculpt a space in 3D. So this lady here sees a representation of a 3D table and feels there is a table. That in itself is enough to later on have any line you see in space to be uh, careful. Uh, so you quickly install th these kind of things in your mind. Uh, and I think that is a bit the end of my presentation. Uh, oh, I forgot, yeah, no, I quickly indicate. We have been using this inside of um, research programs for to turn it to different uses. Like here, this was together with a team of neurologists for uh, making uh, uh, a treatment a therapy in VR for uh, depressive patients. Uh, it has been tested uh, extensively uh, in different means uh, and actually it works. Uh, I mean, of course, every individual insight is different. You still need a, a therapist, uh, but the principle works and the principle works uh, better if you use space. That also has been proved and uh, there's a publication in the medical journal to be about that soon. Uh, okay, so uh, we are now using scans, 3D scans a lot, and that part will be told to you by Ishtar. Okay. Thank you, Eric. So we now have to quickly switch uh, projects um, because we have a lot of different sources and things uh, going on. So the project uh, we're going to present now is um, a bit of a copy. Ah, that's no good. Here, just go to the VR. I'll just talk while I change it. It's okay. So um, we, we work in, in different technologies, so also in different game engines, so sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to have everything uh, working together. So now we, we, we were going to start a representation of um, Hands-On Hamlet, but it's not exactly the way it looks. Normally it has different textures and things, um, but we don't have the latest version uh, running here. So it should start now, and then we're in Hands-On Hamlet. So Eric uh, is going to go in immersion, and so, um, yes. So what we can see is um, th the thing which is important in Hands on Hamlet and which was a major step forward for crew is that they started working with avatars animated uh, in 3D in this way. And um, in, in line with, with the past uh, evolutions, um, there's a juxtaposition of uh, the avatars and uh, what's to say the real world, the recordings that are made with a 360 degree camera 
um, during uh, the registrations of the recordings of the performance. And so you can, uh, so we don't have the sound now, but normally so you hear Hamlet speaking, but it, it's quite peculiar because the, the avatars are talking to each other. So they're kind of playing Hamlet together and, and the immersant is, is moving through it a bit like a ghost, which is uh, appropriate because of the ghost uh, in Hamlet. And so the immersant is not acknowledged. So there's a, a completely different uh, way of interacting with uh, the environment and what goes on than in these uh, 360 degree video uh, pieces where you are really at the center of the thing. Here you almost feel isolated and outside of the thing, but it gives you a, a particular perspective and another approach to to how this goes. So you can see that these balls are floating in the air. You cannot see it in 3D, of course, because your image is flat. But normally you see them in 3D, you put your head in, and all of a sudden it goes full screen, and you're inside this image. And if you take your head out, then you're again in the other thing. And so it negotiates, I think it's very illustrative, it, it negotiates the space between um, the 3D and the 360 degree video in quite uh, an efficient way. So um, we can now. Hi, can you help me please? Can you um, go out of uh, Hands on Hamlet and I can start my video? Which video? Uh, I'll start it, I'll start it. It's okay, just put me in the... In the where's my mouse? Well, I'm whichever, yeah. I'm going to the video up via the... Yeah, 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 via VLC. VLC. Of the desktop. Okay. Of the desktop. Mm -hmm. no, right, I'm close up. And I think he has the video, huh? Uh, sorry, it's all uh, glued together with gaffer tape. That's the way we do it today. Um, so if I can just find the right video where it's present, present, yes. So here we are. So um, from this point onward, it was uh, interesting to see how can we um, work with, uh, with avatars or what we call NPCs and agents and all these different things. Because if you work only with, um, if you work only with um, canned animations, such as in Hands on Hammett, there's of course not a lot of interaction which is possible. Um, this is a sketch that we made for um, Present, uh, which, is a re which was a research project uh, where we collaborated mainly on this with uh, INRIA. And so I made this sketch, which are traditional techniques in uh, Unreal Engine uh, for making uh, sketches of um, avatar behavior and AI behavior um, in, in, in the project. So we, we made this sketch and then we sent it over to INRIA and we saw how, how it could interact with their, um, with their technology. This is a more advanced um, example of AI in, um, in Unreal Engine. So this is a hide and seek uh, bot. So every time the other robot hides you, he will go to some angle where he can hide. So the, we had a very productive uh, creative loop with the people from INRIA. Um, so it, it, it became kind of the basis for their research. Um, so if you see it here, so what they did is um, they, they developed a system uh, where the, the movement of agents is generated um, with a type of uh, thing called interaction fields. And so every, every dot is an agent and the way they interact is by force field. So every interaction, every agent has a force field which can influence one or more agents. And in this way, you can kind of create a social space. So you can define the rules of making a social space without um, programming every agent by hand. And so this, for example, here, the blue agent is hiding from the red agent and, is, um, and will hide behind other agents. And so in this way, we can approach crowds, which was interesting uh, for us to see how could we do this without having to, I don't know if you would play video games, but in video games, the interaction with NPCs is often very um, static or predictable or things like this. And this is a much more fluid way uh, of approaching it. It's, it's also very researchy and maybe not as clean as some things that you can do, um, but it's very effective. For example, this is a simulation of a museum where you can see um, that you have these uh, agents and when the simulation starts, when the simulation starts, um, they start moving and they go from screen to screen, for example, which is a use case which is not very interesting for us, but it gives you an idea of the things uh, that we could do. So. Of course, you have the agents, but you also have the self. And as Eric said, um, it is very difficult to um, represent the self in 3D VR. Uh, there's no, if, if, you have a, if you have a 360 image of yourself, you of, even if it's re a recorded image of someone else and you don't see the face, you will immediately feel as if it's you. 
but in VR it just doesn't work that way. So a lot of work that we do is investigating how we can represent the self in VR and it is sometimes less than obvious. For example, uh, sometimes we have noticed that not having a body gives more sense of embodiment than having a body. This is uh, an IK body we had. This is until recently this was kind of the state of the art of how to represent a body in um, uh, how to represent a body in VR um, but now with the entire uh, Facebook meta push into technologies there's a lot of research piling into this and a new approach uh, based on, um, on on deep learning which will uh, help with this but of course then we are in the area of Zuckerberg which is not a very nice area to be but they are doing research which is very important to the idea of um, to the idea of VR. So what is important as well is that so we have um, we have uh, we have environments, we have people. We we work a lot on the environments. Actually, I will show you a couple of, of them uh, later in uh, VR. But for example, we did uh, lately um, we do very big uh, scans. We don't only do scans. We also do uh, procedural modeling and traditional modeling. But for example, this is at the uh, triple style in the near the Garde Midi where we took I think uh, 100 uh, wait let me see I think we have about uh, yeah something like uh, I think 200 scans or something on top of a bunch of uh, uh, yeah 89 scans which are recognized anyway so it's a lot of scans um, these then get processed. We can use them as a point cloud, uh, which is which can be nice. We can also process them in a the mesh, which I will show later for Delirious departures. Um, so these are the type of uh, things we like to do to um, be able to not only use it in uh, to not only use it in VR, but also to prepare our performances and even to use it in the tracking. We're working on a new type of tracking where the scans are actually used as a reference point um, for. Yeah, it has a hard time dealing with it, but as a reference point of, um, of, of where you are in the space. So um, these are the type of things uh, that we are doing. We, uh, the present project is over. Um, we are now moving um, to a new project, but first I will uh, show you Delirious Departures. So Delirious Departures is, um, wait, let me started. Uh, Delirious Departures is a piece that we made, uh, we started making during the pandemic. Um, we were scanning railway stations and we were contacted by uh, Europalia organization um, to ask whether we could do something around railway stations, so that was uh, obviously very good. And when we started scanning, we noticed that um, because people were sitting very still due to social distancing and everything, that they would be in the scan solidified and part of the architecture and we found, we found that very inspiring. So within the pro present project we do not only work on AI and tracking and things like this but we also work on the representation of humans and how we feel towards different animations, representations, shapes of human encounters um, that you can have in the virtual. So we did a lot of aesthetic research on that, we did a lot of um, experiential research on that. Um, which resulted in uh, this piece, which then integrates part of the technologies, for example, the crowd simulations, etc., that we have from the present project. So I'm going to go uh, in uh, VR and see what it looks like. Um, can I have a controller, please? So, for example, one of the things that we learned, you will see that here we have pieces of scans and a lot of debris. One of the things that we learned is if you have too much, um, if you have too much detail, it can be hard for someone to, um, it can be hard to, for someone to to actually see something else. We have very, if you have a very detailed image, it can become uh, too impressive, and then people are not um, able to see an interaction or have an encounter with a, with a human, for example. Normally, we have Hario here in mocap. I'm not sure whether we're going to have him. Maybe not now, we'll have it later. Um, so, uh, for example, this debris that you see, it's all people who passed by and that we just didn't clean up in the piece. It's a way for us of, like, uh, it's, it's a bit like 3D shadows of people passing by, in a way. Um, and so this is a corridor that you uh, surely know of the Brussels Central Station, which is not a very pleasant place to be in general. Um, and so you see that here, um, the avatars acknowledge 
me and they will try to avoid me. It's not perfect, but it, when you're in the immersion, it's actually quite, um, it's actually quite intense. You, you feel uh, that, that they're really coming up to you and they're a bit attitude, <laughs> they kind of have an attitude. And so um, they, not, they do not only react to me, they also react to the performer when he's in the piece. Um, could you look at uh, getting the mocap running? Yeah. Okay, no, that's okay. We're gonna set, look at it later. So, um, yeah. So these are the type of avatars we make. We kind of work on the assumption that we do we do not believe in photorealism. Um, we kind of make these sculptural, grungy avatars um, because they have a lot of personality, and it's not uncanny valley because we feel that in VR, especially uh, in canny valley, is very strong and uh, unpleasant. So these are that was an example. For example. Um, this is another example of the more stylized environments that we have so that people can sit down. They sit down on an actual chair which corresponds with these benches. And then they, they really, uh, we have the canned animations and the actor and they interact in a way that it becomes um, unclear uh, what is alive, what is, what is live, what is recorded, what is animated and so forth. Um, this is an example of our very high detail scans. So you can see that the people um, who are sitting down, they're sitting perfectly still. So this means that they're at in at least three LiDAR scans without moving. Uh, similarly, we see some debris of people who are moving, but we thought it was very fitting for this um, post-apocalyptic uh, pandemic uh, feeling that was uh, running through the world in 2021. Um, Yes, we have some different uh, things, but uh, I'm not going to show you the entire installation um, with some um, perceptual things and so forth. And this is Antwerp Central, as you recognize. We really chose to keep um, the... Our scanner is not an amazing scanner, actually, um, which gives these very... Uh, what we call the Chernobyl effect. So there's some noise and there's a way that the, that the, that the mesh um, kind of collapses on itself and, and degrades, uh, which we find uh, aesthetically pleasing and very suitable for this project. So that is uh, the idea of delirious departures. No, it's okay. We're gonna move to we're gonna move to the next part. Um, so let's see if I can get back into the camera. Maybe you can put the. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be okay. So can you start the XR project? Then I will talk a bit about. Um, so um, we are now part of a. Wait, let me see. Sit into. The, Look into the camera. So we are now working on a new. Um, we're working on a new uh, Horizon project, which is called Max R. Uh, it's with a lot of uh, very heavy hitters industrially, people like the Foundry and these guys and things like that. Um, and within it, uh, we are working on uh, the tracking system. As Eric mentioned, we work with the University of Hasselt for tracking systems, um, but also some. Um, so now I showed you Delirious Departures. Delirious Departures is one person in immersion and one person, um, and one person uh, actor. This is good, but of course, um, if you're a cultural professional, you know that this is going to be a problem. So we're now expanding, we're now taking what we learned in the present project and in Maxar, and we're, we're taking it to um, different levels by having multiple immersions uh, streaming over uh, wireless. We have uh, University of Pompeii Fabro, we are optimizing the wireless network. And, uh, and, and such things. So it's, it's a bit more of an innovation action. It's, more, it's a more concrete uh, way of working, but it's gonna push us uh, much further. So now we hope that we can do um, performances in spaces with, um, we hope, uh, at least eight people um, in immersion. But then um, an important part of the research is also which medium is the right medium for which type of content or kind of experience that you want to create. So you can layer the media, but you also have to think um, in VR, you experience things in a very direct fashion. You're a protagonist. You're, you're in it in, in a very immediate way. Um, if you are in, um, if, if you do things in XR, for example, by augmenting with um, virtual production, which I'm going to show in a bit, or different things, um, y it, it's much easier to convey um, uh, like embodiment necessarily, but you do have a way that we are strained to uh, analyze images and so forth where you can really direct the way people are looking and things like this, things which do not really work um, in VR. Yeah. So we now um, started the very experimental, uh, yeah. <laughs> very experimental XR project. I um, hope it's going to work.
the time you don't want to work and sp and do your sports and everything with with, with a headset on it, it's a pretty dystopic idea but that does not mean that us in the arts uh, and cultural sector cannot do um, interesting and intense things with it which is a bit our proposition so important for us is the free walking and the different things so I think you can now see I'm not sure what you see um, but I, I can think we can do us without VR okay so yeah. we do it without VR so why did the VR not work? Uh, I think something something crashed. Uh, conflict with other projects. Okay, that's what I was afraid of. That's okay. So um, as as a so this will be a demonstration of some very basic uh, type of uh, virtual production. If you don't know virtual production, it's all the rage uh, in the VFX industry because they can actually visualize what's going on in uh, the stage, and it works with a tracked camera. So um, what we can do. The illusion only works if there's nobody standing in between. Eric, can you? Uh, um, yeah, so uh, it, it's not very laggy, but so you can see that the camera and um, the video, well, the camera and the video are um, synced in perspective. And so in this way, you can start layering different types of, um, different types of images. But the thing is, um, because you're working with a game engine and everything is real time, you can have your real time content running through it and you can start layering it. Um, which can be very useful, especially for showing people what goes on in immersion, to overlay the reality with the VR and to choose which parts of it are visible and are not visible can be, can be very creative. And then we can have different people in mocap suits, uh, etc. Do you think your mocap will work now? Or it's working. It is working? Ah, yes, that's you. Okay. Not, um, You're not calibrated. I'm not yes. Calibrated, yeah, so we can add different types of, we can add different types of uh, content. And then, um, and then we can do the same in VR. So we cannot show it right now, but we can do the same in VR in the sense that um, we can take parts uh, with see-through and but also with uh, video planes. We can take what's going on on a camera and take it back in VR, making a really uh, different types of layers of reality, uh, which can be very creative in seeking like where is the disruption and where is the tension um, between these type of things. So um, that's kind of it for me. I don't know if you still want to say something. Uh, well, I think there were, were there any questions? Yes, so we, we will now go to the, to uh, but, but they cannot answer us because we can, uh, we have to move to Zoom. Okay. So we're going to stop the broadcast. Um, we're going to paste the Zoom uh, link in the chat. We do it with YouTube because otherwise uh, we don't, the, the visual quality is not good enough. So uh, see you in the Zoom where you can ask some questions. And if you don't ask questions there, uh, we'll be later at email um, for anything. So uh, thank you very much and uh, see you on the other side.